hi guys welcome back to my channel wait 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 before i jump into this video yes this is a mosquito net yes i am it behind my bed wabi hakuna and anyway i'm trying out like a new setup i'm trying to see if i can be filming from here because this is like so much more comfortable i actually have a fucking table you know this time i've been using an ironing board as a table do you know that you don't know that i hope you know that but anyway i don't want to talk too much because today's case is actually going to be a very long case and also i'm trying to like film before my neighbors decide to wake up and their dogs and cg somebody likes to somebody who has moved into this building that likes to play reggae at like 4 a.m ni 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 nani you know that's trauma that's childhood trauma address it address it there's no need you need to be playing reggae for the entire building at four anyway without further ado let us get right into today's video now before i go anywhere i just want to make a cute i just want to make a few very important disclaimers today i mean no disrespect to anybody that i talk about in this video i mean no disrespect to their family to the victim their family and or anybody else who is involved in this case furthermore i would really appreciate it if any of you had any additional information please comment down below in the comment section because that is why we are here any information relayed in this video is information that can be found online I will link the sources down below where I got the information. And if you have any additional information, please let us know down below in the comment section politely. Today's case involves a rape, sexual harassment and or assault, decapitation and dismembering of a body and also obviously murder. I mean, you kind of have to kill the person before you do the rest, right? So if you don't feel comfortable with any of that, please click out. Please feel free to click out of this video. Do not stay somewhere where you don't want to stay and scar yourself and then now come and say i should have said this is your warning now for today's case we're actually going to be discussing mr farah swale noor now now even though the person we are going to be discussing is t this case will not be taking place in kenya it will actually be taking place in ireland the case is also famously known as the scissor sister case but i don't want to really call it that because then it takes the attention away from farah who is who we are here to discuss today. Now, Farah Swale Noor was born as Shailila Saeed Salim in Kenya in 1965. Now, not much is known about Mr. Farah Swale Noor's early life, except for the fact that he actually didn't want to be in Kenya. Apparently, Farah really didn't like the living situations in Kenya, and he actually tried everything to escape. In 1993, Farah actually recruited... Farah actually got the help of mercenaries or like, well, human traffickers, because I don't know why we're calling them mercenaries, to be smuggled from Kenya into Europe. Now, I have discussed this in another video called the African Slave Trade, and I will link it up here. Farah actually recruited the help of these human traffickers to be able to be smuggled into Europe. This was in 1993, and although Farah did embark on, did allegedly embark on the journey, he actually wouldn't make it that far. This was obviously a knockback and a setback for Mr. Farah Swale, but Farah actually didn't quit because three years after trying to be human trafficked and smuggled into Europe, he actually discovered a very clever plan. In 1996, Farah actually applied to enter Ireland, claiming to be a citizen of Somalia that was actually running from the Somalian civil war. Naturally, he did get, you know, asylum in Ireland. They did allow him in Ireland. I'm not sure what part of Ireland. It just said Ireland. I don't know if it's Northern Ireland or just Ireland. Like, I'm not sure. But he did get into Ireland. Now, this was in December of 1996. Farah's dreams of leaving Kenya finally came true. Farah would finally travel to Ireland. And honestly, when he got to Ireland, he maintained his story that he was a Somalian man running from the Somalian civil war. He actually changed his name when he moved to Ireland. And people actually didn't know him as Shailila Salim. People either knew him as Farah Swale Noor or Shailila Swale Shagu. Anyway, Mr. Farah is now in Ireland. He's entirely his entire life has now changed. He's living he's living the life he's always wanted. He's living lavish, baby. He's living lavish, baby. Now, one thing about Mr. Farah, as soon as he got into Ireland, he got into the business of trying to get a woman. Now, Farah, Farah, Farah. This is where Farah lost me. 
you see i can understand wanting to escape you know maybe maybe the living conditions in kenya were not giving what they were supposed to give but i can understand wanting to leave kenya but it's what farah decides to do upon arriving in ireland that really makes me look at him like did you really want to leave to go and get a better life and to go and work or did you just want to leave so you can go and be pulling the foolishness in somebody else's land While he's in ireland farah now starts to Farah immediately gets into the business of trying to find a girlfriend slash a babe. But I don't know why this man ignored all the women, all the legal aged women in the country and decided to go and be messing about with 16 year olds. In fact, Farah actually went on to rape two 16 year olds and one of them was actually mentally disabled and one of them who actually gave birth to a son for farah now if you're angry now because this is what this man has decided to do as soon as he stepped into a new country you're not even about to listen to what i'm about to say because in fact the world doesn't operate on the side of justice it really doesn't now in 1999 the authorities would actually find out that mr farah swali noor was actually capping about being somebody who was from somalia who was you know rife with somalian civil war and he couldn't do anything and things were not doing the doings they found out that he was capping they found out he was from a very stable place in kenya in fact farah swali noor had not only lied to the authorities in ireland he actually came into ireland and said he had nobody back home First of all, home, he lied, was not Somalia. The home he was discussing was Kenya. Second of all, not only was he discussing the home in Kenya, he also lied saying that he had nobody back home and everybody had been, you know, blown to bits. Because he allegedly had an entire wife and kids back at home in Kenya, who he had left back home in Kenya. Now... As soon as the authorities find this out, they call Mr. Faraswale in. They say, "Come, come, come, Maya, come, Maya." Faraswale is called in for questioning, and can you imagine that at the end of this questioning, despite the fact that Faraswale Noor had been capping, despite the fact that he abandoned his family back home, <laughs> the child that he had raped somebody to get is what made him stay in Ireland apparently the authorities didn't take him out of ireland because he already had an irish child now i will be clear though let me say this some sources do say that the child that is being discussed here is the child of the 16 year old girl that he did rape the disabled 16 year old girl that, girl that he did rape and then some of them say that it's another child so if you have any information on that please actually just let me know down below farah would actually be described as a very violent and abusive partner by many of the women that he was you know even consensually with not just rape not just through rap and assault no he was described by every woman that he had ever been with said that he was very very misogynistic he didn't think that women deserved anything in this life he thought that women were just sex objects and which now propelled him to you know feel that it was okay for him to just take sex whenever he wanted from them which means that he did a lot of his partners he would also abuse them there is also report there's one who reported that he actually used to threaten her with a knife to the point where she had to go and get a banning order now what is a banning order let me read that right here because i don't want to get that wrong for you a barring order not banning barring order a barring order in the family courts acts to protect more victims from being repeatedly dragged back to court by their abusive ex-partners um, that is by Lord Wolfson. That is the description given by Lord Wolfson, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State, Ministry of Justice. Okay, I'll put that like I'll put the link down below if you want to go and check that out. But that is what a barring order means. So basically, she didn't want to have anything. So basically, the partner who was threatened with the knife didn't want to have anything to do with Mr. Farah Swale Noor. Now, during his time in Ireland, like literally his first like four years in Ireland, Farah actually came into contact with the law a lot. He got convictions, but I don't know if he like spent time in jail because, you know, like when I was reading this case, it was saying convictions, convictions, but I'm like, okay, but was he in prison? It wasn't clear about that. He was convicted for multiple offenses, including intoxication, threatening and abusive behavior and assault. That was towards his partners. Farah also had eight charges of disorder and assault. And one of the assault cases involved an assault with a knife. 
and he was actually convicted on three occasions but according to what i saw it wasn't clear whether he served jail time so i just concluded he probably didn't because i feel like if he did they would have said serve jail time from this time to this time so he was convicted of those things but he never really went to jail well it's unclear now that is the background or well the the overview of who Mr. Farah Swali Noor was and now for you to understand exactly what happened in this case I need to introduce a few more characters so just pay attention and just follow through and I think you, you'll actually be fine you'll get it if I got it you can get it um the first person I would like to introduce is Kathleen Mohall now in 2003 Mr. Farah would actually meet Miss Kathleen Mohall Kathleen Mohall was a woman in her late 50s when she actually met Mr. Swale Noor. She was married to a man named Mr. John Mohall and they had six children. Now, although Kathleen was married to John, her and him, the marriage wasn't really going well. Her and him liked to drink together. That was something that they liked to do, you know, Kathleen and John. But the problem is when John got drunk, he actually became abusive towards Kathleen. I don't know if he was abusive towards the children, but I do know he was abusive towards Kathleen herself. Now, this was like a very common kind of theme. And obviously, you know, after some time, Kathleen was getting tired, which made it the perfect kind of environment for when she met Mr. Farah Swale Noor. Obviously, when Farah heard of, you know, how John was treating Kathleen, he really really turned on the charm. Farah is said to have, you know, made Kathleen believe that he was different. He wasn't like John. He wasn't misogynistic. He wouldn't beat anybody. That is crazy. Are you insane? And he really had Kathleen believe that he was the answer and John, John's time was done. John had sug out. Okay? Okay. Kathleen is getting closer and closer to Farah. She's drifting even farther away from her abusive husband. Now, with time, Kathleen would actually move Farah Swale Noor into the house that she was living with Mr. John Mohall, her husband, and their children. Now, I know this Miss Mayams is not for real. Because me, I will not be in my house and then you come and drag someone. Okay, understandably, he was abusing her. So I can see where that I can see where that's coming from. But like if it was like a normal kind of occasion and I'm coming home and I'm meeting somebody in my What? Kathleen moves Farah into the house that she shares with her husband and her six children. And honestly, John Mulhall was really not going to fight Farah. You know, John would obviously be boxing Kathleen in the house. But obviously, when he's now told to carry the same energy to his mates that are his same size, he, he couldn't do it. He just packed up his stuff and he left the house. He accepted the marriage was over and he just left. Honestly, from what it seemed, he left without a fight. That's what it really looked like. He left the house and now Farah Swale Noor becomes the new man of the house. Now, as I said, there were also six other children living in this house. But for the purposes of this case, I'm going to just introduce the two that are very important to the case because the rest, honestly, we didn't. I didn't even find their names like I didn't see their names because it was only these two that were very very important to the case now I'm gonna start with the oldest sister who is Miss Linda Mulhall now Linda was born in 1975 and when this case actually takes place she was about 30 years old now Linda's life was actually a bit upside down if you like are looking at it in terms of like societal standards except actually if you're just looking at it you guys are not going to bully me on this app to say that this was, this is a life that we should all now want to strive and aspire to and be like, normalize this. Uh, we shouldn't normalize this. Linda's life was actually pretty much so a mess. She actually dropped out of high school at a very young age. She also had a history of drug and alcohol abuse by the time this case was taking place. And honestly, Miss Mayam's life was just not going well. She had been convicted of larceny, which is basically theft, but she never really went to prison. Now, I don't know what it means to be convicted and you can't go to prison. Can somebody explain that to me? Because me, I studied law all these years and I'm still not understanding how can you be convicted. Somebody explain, I'm not understanding. Anyway, Linda also had four children after she dropped out of high school with an unknown man. And even though we don't know the name of the father, we do know that her and him did split very early on, like before any of this actually took place. Now, when the two of them split, Miss Linda would actually get involved with a man by the name of Wayne Kinsella. Now, I won't go too much into Wayne, but Mr. Wayne was just, he was not that guy. He was really not that guy. Wayne 
had a very violent past. He had actually been thrown out of school for violent behavior. He didn't even choose to leave. They just said it's, it's enough. The pressure is getting worse. They threw him out of school for violent behavior. And on top of that, he was actually very abusive, like physically abusive in his home. According to his sister, he would actually beat her. And on top of beating her, he would actually beat the parents if the parents tried to question him. He would everybody could actually catch a swing from that man actually according to his sister he had actually beaten her up so bad one time that she actually dislocated her fucking jaw that's how bad he beat her so this is a very violent individual furthermore he had actually been sentenced to prison oh, i think sentence and conviction is different yes actually the law degree is lowing now it's now lowing isn't it yes it is anyway he had actually been sentenced to prison for murder one of the murder charges was actually from him killing a man while he was visiting his wife's grave. How foul do you have to be? Like somebody is going to grieve their wife. You, you are there. What? Anyway, to say the least, the new man, Wayne, that Linda had decided to come and bring into the, children, into the lives of her four little children was very violent and very abusive. And violence and abuse is what he brought into that house. That was his specialty. That was where he stood. He gonna stand beside it. And naturally, as he came into that house, he basically made it a living hell for Linda. Linda's children would actually suffer the most because children usually do. He would be physically abusive to both Linda and her children. And apparently, he would actually beat the children the children with, with electric flex cables. Like, he would... You guys, what is the problem? Nee, nee, nee. Like, you guys need to stop child abuse and stop child abuse now it's too much again wayne would be arrested for seven years for the treatment of the children and honestly it's just sad that the mother let these people this man this nasty man stay in the child in in the lives of her children but i'm nobody to judge because i, I don't have children so i don't know man maybe i don't know i actually don't know because i don't have kids so i just feel like it's it's a bit fucked you know what i mean yeah Anyway, after Wayne went away to prison, Miss Linda would not really have any other notable like man in her life. So Wayne is out of the house. However, this doesn't change much for Linda because Linda doesn't change at all. She still continues to abuse substances and abuse alcohol, to abuse alcohol and drugs. And so her children don't really see much of that kind of change that you would hope to see, you know, once abusive and toxic people are out of somebody's life, you would expect them to change, but not Linda. She stood beside it. So that is the eldest sister, Linda, and now I want to take you to the younger sister named Miss Charlotte Mulhall. Now, Charlotte was born in 1983, and by the time this case was taking place, she was 21 at the time. Like her sister, Charlotte had a history of drug and alcohol abuse, and she also didn't finish high school. She also had a number of, of minor previous convictions for criminal damage and public order offenses, and she was charged with criminal damage. I'm not sure if she spent time in prison for that. I I don't know no, but that's what it said girl anyway on top of that it is alleged that miss charlotte was actually a prostitute by the time this case was taking place and this doesn't mean that i'm trying to discriminate against sexual workers no 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 this is just something that you know was written so i've decided to relate to all y'all anyway so that is miss charlotte mohall her mother kathleen and her other sister linda now as i said miss mohall met mr faras wale noor moved him into the house and now charlotte linda and Kathleen are the ones who are the three who interact the most with Mr. Farah Swale Noor, partially because the three of them actually apparent, allegedly used to do drugs and alcohol together, but I don't know to what extent that is true. I don't, I'm not really sure, and I'm not one to come on here and be like it's drought when i don't know now life in the house for everybody was actually pretty hell because farah quickly proved to be a capper he actually proved to be exactly or even worse than john mohall in terms of abusing miss kathleen mohall it would later be found out that he actually used to miss kathleen mohall and he was actually pretty abusive towards her again i don't know if he was also abusive towards the children but i do know he was abusive towards her apparently the abuse was so bad that kathleen actually decided to go and call one of farah's exes to ask you know exactly what you should do you know for any kind of advice what would she advise her to do etc etc and miss mr man's his ex was just like you need to get the fuck out now like before that man kills you you need to get the fuck now kathleen heard this from the ex but kathleen honestly decided i'm the one who actually knows my man and my man he can be trusted i think that's 
what she thought but also some sources say that maybe she was actually scared to leave mr mr faraz wale so that's why she stayed but after she was told this by you know faraz ex she still did decide to stay in the relationship now kathleen would continue to stay with faraz wale noor now kathleen and mr farah would actually stay together until sunday the 20th of march 2005 she stuck it out for all that time until the fateful day that I just referred to. So what happened on Sunday, the 20th of March, 2005, you might wonder. I'm going to tell you what happened. Sunday, the 20th of March actually fell on St. Patrick's Day weekend. Now, you probably should Google that because I'm not going to assume to know exactly what it's about. So you just Google that before I describe it here and then you want to come and be like, you didn't even do your research when you could also have done your research, girl. Now, Kathleen Mulhall and Farah would actually rent a small cottage in enrichment cottages in Dublin for them to actually spend the weekend. The two would spend the weekend drinking, you know, getting high and partying now on that specific sunday the two of them were inside drinking partying doing it all up until they got a call from miss linda the elder of the two girls i had introduced earlier linda hits them up and he she's like hey do you guys want to chill with me and charlotte now obviously farah and his babe said yes because you know they were like you know we're gonna come through with the drinks we're all gonna enjoy ourselves etc so farah and his babe were like you know what why not why not enjoy it why not have a good old weekend and enjoy now although linda was very hyped for this day miss charlotte on the other hand was not according to charlotte she had actually been drinking the entire weekend and she was like ready for this whole saint patrick's thing to end she was like you know what it's cute but it's not that cute it's cute but it's not cute enough have to keep me out until this time charlotte wanted this weekend to end so she can go back to her normal regular regular life girl but Miss Linda managed to convince Charlotte that they should go out, you know, just have a blast, have some fun this weekend. And Charlotte was like, you know what, fine, I'll come with you, I'll come with, and we can, we can just, we can celebrate this and leave it. If you're gonna, that, if that means you're gonna leave me alone, I'll come. You know those kind of situations where you're like, bro, come out and you can imagine to come. So Linda and Charlotte start making their way over to meet their mother and Mr. Farah Swale. And they met in a McDonald's in Dublin. And when they meet up, they decide to go and buy some drinks. Now, Farah used to drink like way too much. So they couldn't like go to a bar and, you know, order drinks. They actually had to like wait and go to an entire like wines and spirits so they can get like, you know. A big swig like a big bag a big an entire thing so that mr faraz wale would be able to like drink to his stomach's fill so at this point they buy mr faraz wale the drinks and as they're and they decide to continue to walk around dublin just enjoying the beautiful day and and it's at this point that miss linda pulls out some ecstasy pills linda pulls out the pills and she now starts to, and she gives some to miss charlotte all this while mr faraz wale noor and the girl's mother they're just like in their their own element they're not really paying attention to what's going on with the girls and when they do now pay attention they now realize that oh shit miss linda has some ecstasy pills so kathleen walks over to her daughter um you know basically stomps over there and she doesn't look too happy and obviously you're expecting this girl to be like you know what the hell are you doing girl why is you popping pills but no kathleen actually asks linda for some ecstasy pills for herself and she also asks mr farah swale noor if he was gonna pop some pills now farah said no he wasn't gonna pop some pills not because of anything else but because of the fact that he felt like you know i'm already drinking i've already been drinking this entire weekend now i have this entire other bottle that i'm drinking with so let me just not let me just not he was just like he doesn't want i don't want to go there he didn't want to open that round and you know some of you should be responsible because some of you used to go outside and you make it everybody else's business to take care of you by the way this is why i don't like going out because some of you like to oh no some of you like to go out and just act foolish anyway anyway so farah says he doesn't want to pop some ecstasy pills but he does continue to actually drink he continues to drink until they all decided to go back home at around 6 p.m that sunday the family begins their walk back home and it's at this point that it actually became clear exactly how drunk farah swale noor was because as they were walking home mr farah swale noor now sees a child and the child was a little boy and he runs to the child and he actually thought that this child was the child of that girl that he raped all those years ago 
and he now picks the child up and starts saying this is my child this is my baby i'm so happy what 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 and it really became evident that this man was really drunk like he was over the top drunk this now annoyed kathleen mulhall which now led her to now get pissed at mr faras walenur kathleen was pulling him telling him let's go we need to go etc etc and although mr farah ended up putting the baby down because that wasn't his baby no the mood is already like spoiled and dead so miss kathleen mulhall's two daughters decide to actually put on some shana ball so that they can actually like enjoy some time and try and like lift up the mood they put on some dirty wine music and they start whining and dancing okay i don't know if they were whining i wasn't there girl i wasn't i wasn't there okay i i don't know but they start dancing in the living room and it's at this point that you know the light the mood does lighten up however mr farah still hasn't you know stood up from where he's sitting kathleen is happy the girls are happy but farah is still doing saying gemenge he's like oh i mean it's not all that it's just sean paul and it's at this point that kathleen decides to actually put ecstasy in mr farah swally's drink to you know make him give him a buzz and like put him on their level according to her i guess and when she did this things obviously did escalate because you can't just drug someone and think things are just gonna remain stagnant and normal that's not normal anyway now farah has been drugged and he now starts to really get into the vibe he starts to feel the music he really starts to feel like wow you know things are really going they are going somewhere farah now starts to look about and he sees linda dancing linda being the eldest daughter and he really starts to get into the dancing with linda and he really starts to feel linda's dancing so when linda went to sit down on the couch for that Kafara was sitting on he actually started feeling her up and touching her up and touching her body up and apparently allegedly he actually told her that she was a lady of the night just like her mother anyway this obviously bothered miss kathleen mohall you know sitting there watching basically your boyfriend who has been living with your daughters as though he's their stepdad like damn that's my man you know what i mean that's that's my man that's what she now started to think so she now starts to get annoyed and she obviously goes over to him and tells him you know stop feeling her up like that stop touching her up like that etc 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 on top of that linda's younger sister charlotte actually goes up to him and tells him you know stop touching her up like that stop feeling her up like that however like i said mr farah was a misogynist so he actually didn't give a damn he don't, i don't give a damn what is this he didn't care he didn't care so they're now starting to tell him to get away from her etc and like i said farah was a very violent man so now charlotte is actually and he didn't really like to like argue especially with women so as they're now telling him to leave miss you know linda alone mr farah now gets pissed off and he starts to tell them off and starts to tell them you know to get get out of here to go away like nobody wants you here nobody wants you here go away naturally this pissed off miss miss kathleen however this also really pissed off miss charlotte because number one charlotte is now really scared for herself and she's also really scared for her sister because she doesn't know if this man will just flip out and begin to just box all of them in that house now so charlotte now decides to go into the kitchen and get a bread cutter knife of which when she comes back she tells mr she tells Mr. Faraswali again to let her sister go. It's really giving Pharaoh, let my people go. Mr. Faraswali still refused to let Linda Mohall go. And it's at this point that Miss Charlotte actually took the box cutter and slit his throat. Now, I want you to just look at what a box cutter knife looks like. And I want you to tell me, like, you guys, would she not have had to be really, really close to the man who would have obviously beaten her and boxed the shit out of her if she even dared to get that close i don't know how she did it she must have been like really swift with that kind of cut you know what i'm saying anyway she slits his throat and because the knife was so small and so tiny it actually took time for farah to understand what was going on it even took time for her mother to actually understand what exactly was going on because she was just like what's what's wrong farah all of a sudden stands up he's now gagging at his neck he's feeling like oh my god what's going on he's stumbling etc and that's when kathleen the mother actually realizes oh my gosh she actually stabbed him as farah is stumbling around he actually starts to cry out to his baby girl miss kathleen that he was basically just about a box if i'm being honest because he was getting pretty pissed at them 
he calls out to her and he starts calling her by her nickname for her to help him. Now, as Kathleen is seeing Mr. Farah Swale obviously staggering around, stumbling around, struggling to breathe, etc., she now turns to her daughters and she says, kill him or he will kill me. Now, when she says this, all of a sudden, because there was no information as to where this Miss Girl got this, this equipment, but she says this and then immediately she goes and gets a hammer and a bread knife and hands it to her daughters and basically instructs them to basically kill this man now she gave a hammer to linda while she gave the bread knife on top of the box cutter knife she gave the and then she gave a bread knife to miss charlotte now the two sisters get to work while miss kathleen sits somewhere and doesn't do anything and she was just there gasping basically she wasn't really doing much after instructing people to kill on your behalf you just go day you're just going to go and sit down that's crazy to me anyway so miss charlene goes and sits down and when the deed was done she would come back according to the autopsy mr farah swale noor was actually stabbed a total of 28 times and on top of being stabbed a total of 28 times mr farah swale noor was also also had his head bashed in with the hammer he would actually die and the autopsy would also show that he suffered serious blunt force trauma after the deed is done and the girls now begin to realize exactly what has happened here they now start to panic and they don't know what to do kathleen tells her daughters to actually move the body of mr swale noor from the living room which is where all this took place to the back so that if anyone ever like you know so that if anyone even comes into the cottage you know it's like okay there's nothing here nothing's going on there was no alarm so the two girls did that just that and when they were in the back miss kathleen now allegedly instructs the girls to dismember the body of her now deceased boyfriend mr farah swale noor the girls like i said only had the equipment that had been given to them by their mother to, you know kill mr swale noor so that is exactly what they used to dismember his body they literally used a butter knife a box cutter you guys i can't even make this shit up this crazy shit they used a butter knife a box cutter knife and on top of that they used the hammer they cut up the body into eight pieces and when they were done they also dismember they also decapitated mr farah swale noor and on top of decapitating mr farah swale noor their mother kathleen came back inside because like i said how she doesn't want to do anything she just gives instructions and goes so during this time she was smoking when they were doing all the dismembering of the body etc etc this took a total of four hours of which kathleen really didn't help she didn't really do anything according to what was said she came back inside when the job was done and then she tells her girls that you know mr farah swale noor had actually you know raped her and this is at which point one of her daughters actually decided to cut off mr farah swale's willy you know damn and keep it for i don't know why she kept it but she cut it off and kept it now after the women are done they're now faced with the question of how to dispose and where to dispose of the body the women go into panic and they decide to actually call mr john Mulhall, hall who is their biological father and their mother's you know their mother's husband because i don't think just by you moving another man in you've divorced if if i'm being frank i don't know so they decide to call him up and they tell him the story on the phone but the father honestly thought that you know what these girls are high like these girls like he was just like you know what these there's no way ain't no way bro so he makes his way there you know hoping to go and collect his daughters who he's now thinking ah these women have gone out they've gotten drunk they're high he gets there and it's at this point when he's there that he's now in that he now enters the house sees there's nothing wrong and he's like ah knew it they were high but when they now take him to the back that's when he's like wait a minute wait a minute I think I found my consciousness in a sixth dimension. And that's when he sees the dismembered body parts of Mr. Farah Swale Noor. Obviously, he knows who this is because, you know, they had kicked him out for this man. And now he's now seeing this man basically dismembered and put up in body bags. The girls now look at their dad and ask, you know, what should we do? We need your help. And at this point, he literally just looked at them told them he didn't know what to do he also told them that obviously he wasn't gonna snitch them but he said he didn't know what to do and he actually didn't want to be involved in any of this mr john moho would get back in his car and drive off he really he, he said no i i don't want to know what's going on here and i don't care i don't want to know 
I'm no. He said, I'm not gonna snitch you, but just leave me alone. Leave me out of this. I don't want to gain. As John leaves, the women finally, you know, have a chat about exactly what they were gonna do. And the women finally decide that they're actually gonna dump the body in the canal nearest them. So seeing as all of this is happening in the dead of night, the women decided that you know what, right now is the best time to get in a car, drive down to the canal, and dump the body parts. So they did just that. They went down to the local canal, dumped Mr. Swale Noor's body parts there, while well, the eight body parts that they had dismembered. However, they did not dump his head inside because they didn't want his head to be discovered because they felt like if they found his head, that would ultimately mean they would find out who he is and they didn't want that to happen. So they kept the head in a backpack and they left after making sure that, you know, the body had drowned to the bottom, the body parts had drowned to the bottom. They left to go and discard the head. The women also did not leave the penis inside. Like, they didn't dump the penis out. And the penis would never be found. But I will tell you what they did with the head. So, the women would actually take a bus to the next town over with the head in the backpack of one of the girls. They went through to the next town. And when they got to the next town, they actually, like, walked around. They CCTV footage of them just walking around, you know, sightseeing with a backpack with a head. Imagine umepanda matatu. And there's somebody who has a head in their bag. At Itana, you steal the bag because, you know, people like to be thieves. You guys like to act foolish in these streets. At Iso Meiba Kichwa. Yeah, you steal the bag and you've now stolen a head. You see, I tell you guys to mind your business. Mind your business. Mind your business. Anyway, so the girls get off of the bus. They get to the next town, get off of the bus, go around window shopping for some time until they decided that they were going to actually bury the head in the town's park under a park bench. They buried the head and with burying the head, all of them agreed that this was going to be the end of that story. Your story, Kufiapo. Nobody was supposed to talk about it. They were not supposed to text about it, communicate about it. They were all just supposed to act like nothing ever happened. Now, obviously, nobody was going to be able to do that because you can't kill someone and then just go about acting like, oh, whatever. Naturally, they were panicking, so they kept on going back to the canal to see if any of the body parts would float back up. Now, whenever they went, they actually didn't see any body parts, and it was actually when they now went, like a week after, it was when they now went to check if the body parts were still floating back up that they actually realized that the police had been called now apparently pieces of the body had actually been floating back up but because of the way the body was cut up like whenever someone saw it they actually thought you know oh it's just a part of a mannequin it's just a part of a mannequin this was until a woman actually saw a human foot like something that actually looked like a human foot that didn't look like a, a mannequin didn't look like anything it looked like an actual human foot it was until that lady saw you know the human foot with a sock on it that she decided like no this is actually too suspicious i'm gonna call the police i'm gonna call one thing about her she called cops as soon as she calls the cops the cops come and they actually realize that this is a dismembered foot they now start to obviously think where could the rest of the body be and they call a group of divers to go into the canal and have a look and see if they could actually get the rest of the body or see if the rest of the body was inside the canal now when all of this is going on and they're diving two of the women would actually come to the scene of the crime and according to sources they can actually be seen on cctv but two of the women would actually be at the scene of the crime when this was actually all unfolding now apparently Apparently without the head, the police actually couldn't find out who this person exactly was. So what they did decide to do is they took pictures of the dismembered body parts and like parts of the clothing that Mr. Faraz Wale Noor was wearing and they decided to post that like to take it to the media to try and get like help and did, did like a public call for help. Once they did do this, they did quickly get a response from Faraz Wale Noor's Friend. Now, Faraz Swale Noor had a friend in Dublin who saw the pictures on the media and was like, wait, that looks like Mr. Faraz's shirt. This is why they always tell you to be original. Wear original clothes. Because now when things are going tough, we can identify you. You see what I'm saying? God forbid anything happens like this to you, boy. You can see what I'm saying. Anyway, so as soon as Mr. Faraz Wale Noor's friend sees this picture, he tries to hit up Faraz Wale Noor several times and Farah wasn't answering. He wasn't picking up nothing, 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 nothing. And he also hadn't ha heard from Farah for a few days, which was quite unusual according to what he said. Now, Farah Swale Noor's friend hits the police up and says, hey, I think that could belong to my friend. Could you just, you know, check it out? Just, you know, just check it out and make sure everything is okay. Now, the guardie, which is like the Irish 
police, I guess, actually did get a DNA sample from one of Farah Swali Noor's children, and they ran it against the DNA of the body they had found in the canal. And guess what? It was a match. It was a match. It was a match. Yeah. So, Faraz Wale Noor has now been found. Everybody is now on edge, wondering exactly what could have happened, what could have gone wrong, and the police now start to look at who Mr. Faraz Wale Noor is usually with. And that is when they now get round to starting to interview the three women. They interviewed the women, and actually the first time around they interviewed the women, everything was fine. Everything checked out. Everybody was like, you know... These women, their alibis are solid, everything is great, everything is going amazing. Now, that is until Linda actually starts panicking. She actually goes into a frenzy and begins to panic after the interview. Actually, after she got out of the interview, she decided to take a bus to the next town to see the head of Mr. Faraz Wale Noor. She digs up the head from under the bench that they had decided that they were never going to touch. And she pulls it out and actually she says she starts praying to the head and apologizing to the head of Faraz Wale Noor. And she says she actually f told the head that she told Mr. Faraz Wale Noor's head that she wishes that it was her mother that had gone and not Faraz Wale Noor. Miss Ma'am. Uh-uh. Anyway, she now decides that she's not going to put the head back because she was scared of being caught. She takes the head and there are several theories about what she did with the head. But the one that was like the most prevalent is that she smashed it up into different pieces and put it like into different bins around the park. And this is the one that really stuck out and also made the most sense because the head was never found and none of the pieces were ever found as well. After Miss Mohall had done this, she then made her way down to the police and she went down to the station and she told the police the entire story. Story. She told them from point A to point Z about everything that happened. And it's at this point the police were like, how? We was, we was going to let these people go. We was going to do that. They was going to do that. Now with a full confession, the police go on to arrest both Charlotte and Linda. However, by the time they got round to arresting Miss Kathleen Mulhall, Kathleen had actually taken off and she was on the run. She would actually remain on the run up until February 2008 when she was actually found living in England under a disguise. Kathleen had actually dyed her hair blonde and changed her last name so that she could receive benefit checks in England. So she was basically like not really working and she was like living real low-key, real chiniawaba, like nobody knew who she was, nobody knew where she was. When she was finally court she was brought in and she was charged with impeding an arrest providing false information about mr farah's death and whereabouts giving false information which could have actually led to the arrest of both linda kathleen and herself and cleaning up the crime scene so she wasn't actually charged with like basically being the mastermind with all, for all of this and she wasn't actually charged with murder because she didn't actually reach the criterion of you know committing a murder or being charged with murder so this is all she was charged with despite the fact that the girls say that she basically is the one who masterminded this entire thing now kathleen would only get five years in prison for this and i'm not really sure exactly how much linda and miss charlotte got but they definitely got more than kathleen i think i think let me not say definitely i don't know but they did um also go to, but they did also go to prison now although linda and miss kathleen are out miss charlotte is still back in the sale honey and none of them actually talked Till this day all of them don't speak and actually when the women went to prison mr john mohall actually committed oh i forgot to add that in the disclaimer that that's what we're going to talk about actually committed s and because of all the trauma that was going on he couldn't believe that his entire family was sentenced and honestly it was really like it was really bad it was really bad for him and he took his own life sadly god rest his soul after linda's release she actually turned back to alcohol because like i told you she already had a drug and alcohol issue and she turned back to that after she was released in 2018 having served 12 years in prison out of a 15 years sentence linda would also go on to have mental health issues and would attempt to take her life several times she also couldn't really care for her four children and they actually ended up being within the care of her brother james who would actually commit fraud and then try and say that he was doing it because he really Really had to take care of these children charlotte as i said still remains in prison and in 2008 she actually sparked controversy in the media when photographs of her actually holding a knife jokingly towards the throat of a male prisoner in mount joy prison were leaked now i don't how did you get in with a male prisoner and you're a female inmate that don't make no sense anyway as a result security in the prison was actually amped and
and she was actually moved from that prison to another one which contains a women's unit wait so this girl was in a in like a co you know multi-sexual kind of prison i didn't know that was possible how is that possible i didn't know that oh well anyway guys that is it for today's video i'm really sorry like you can't really see like the eye look let me just yeah i'm sorry about that the lighting isn't like the best lighting i'm still gonna try and work on my lighting like i'm still trying to you know build myself i hope this video was informative i hope you enjoyed this video and i will see you in my next one please comment down below if you have anything to add to this case and also if you just genuinely have any comments also if you have any suggestions please hit me up on my instagram at page speaks or if you want to see more of me you could also follow me at on my tiktok at page speaks or the kenyan true crimer and yeah i will see you guys in my next one where i finish off my makeup and get ready for church because you know what guys it's actually sunday you know what i'm saying anyway guys i will see you guys on friday with just 